Great to be here with you today, as uh, Pastor Jocelyn said. Hello to everybody in Moose Jaw. Nice uh, to uh, have you in our service today. We are excited about what God is doing. We had, um, yeah. If everybody ran to church like that, that would be great. We allow running to church and running in church here in our building. What was I saying? Oh, yeah, last night. We had a great time last night at the Holy Spirit night here in Regina. People being touched. Um, people encountering. You know, you never get tired of watching people have an encounter with the presence of God. Never gets old. Uh, never gets, I, I never get tired of it. Um, whether it's a physical healing, whether it's someone being baptized in the Holy Spirit in a fresh way, someone's speaking in their personal prayer language for the first time, uh, watching oppression that uh, can come against any of us, uh, but watching oppression that's kind of set in on people, watching that lift off. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's so good what God is doing, and we are so excited um, to just see the Lord uh, on, in, our, in these weekend meetings, but also throughout the week, touching lives. Lord, today, um, this is a day and an hour for us as uh, your church, your people, Lord, to be rising up. Lord, it's not a time to get distracted. It's not a time uh, to even become issue-based. It's a time for us not to pull away, but to press in, to be bold, as Pastor Jocelyn talked about, to be bold, Lord, today we want to be bold for you. Lord, we want to be bold. We want to have a love that causes us to be absolutely fearless. And as we look at your word today, it is in some ways we just focus on some of those uh, key pieces that you lay out uh, in your word for walking in a close and intimate relationship with you. Lord, we pray that today our hearts would be stirred. God, I pray that our hearts would be stirred, that we would be so in love with you, Lord, that everything else will pale in comparison. And not only that, Lord, we will see everything else accurately the way we need to see them. So Holy Spirit, come. Imprint each one of us with these truths today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So if you have uh, a Bible today, electronic or otherwise, uh, we will be using that. Uh, the verses, will actually be looking them up uh, together as opposed to them being on the screen. I'll be reading from the uh, New King James um, for the verses that I'll be uh, reading this morning. Often we're using the New Living Translation. This morning I want to talk to you about an intimate walk with Jesus. An intimate walk with Jesus. Radical love really doesn't make sense. It doesn't. It's not logical doesn't make any sense. Um, you do things when you love someone, you do things that don't make sense. It's not even logical sometimes. You know, I remember when uh, Jocelyn and I were, were, were dating, and of course it, it's not that it stopped there, but it's certainly where it started, um, where we were dating, and you know, I just couldn't wait when she was done teaching school for us to be able to talk on the phone. And you know, I never really liked talking on the phone prior to that. Like I, I don't know, I, there's a lot of things I didn't like that all of a sudden I started to like. I, <laughs> I you know, you know, I grew up on a farm uh, and on our farm, I don't remember drinking tea. But, you know, all of a sudden I'd get asked. We'd go over to her mom and dad's or whatever, and I'd get asked, would you love, like some tea? Oh, I'd love some tea. <laughs> really? <laughs> I'd love some tea. Love doesn't make sense. It's not logical. Jesus coming and dying in our place. The Bible actually, the Bible itself calls it its foolishness in the world's eyes. It doesn't make any sense. But that's the love that not only God has for us, He wants us to experience. He wants us to experience that love. David, David experienced that in his own life. And in the Old Testament, you know, when he's dancing, he's the king. 
of course, and he's the king of the greatest nation on earth. Uh, the superpower of the world at that time was Israel. And he is dancing radically before the Lord. And uh, a lot of times when you see people do things when they are deeply in love, it looks like foolishness. It can't be explained. But you know, this deep love, this intimate relationship that we're talking about this morning, not just accepting Christ as Savior, of course, that's kind of like a wedding day. You know, giving your heart to the Lord, it's a covenant, and, and, and that's not just my analogy. The Scripture talks about this. On a wedding day, that love that people feel for each other, um, res- you know, it, 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 it goes to a whole other level when there's a commitment. There's a covenant that's formed. And actually, the Bible says that covenant that's formed on a wedding day is actually a picture of someone accepting Christ. Because Jesus, and we're going to be sharing communion uh, here in a few moments, but Jesus actually said, this, this, this cup is actually the blood of the new covenant. It's a covenant. Just like marriage is a covenant, when you accept Christ, it's a covenant. You are in covenant relationship with him. And with that, there is this deep, deep sense of not only love, but commitment. And that's why God created us. Originally, in Genesis chapter 3, the scripture talks about God walking in the cool of the day, looking to fellowship with Adam and with Eve. His original intention is still the same. Do you know, he wants, he actually, can I give you a, a deep theological revelation this morning. He likes you. He's crazy about you, actually. And yes, he wants to work in all of our lives, and he wants to bring changes in those areas that we need to see changes. But he can't love you anymore. He is radically in love with you and he likes you some of you need to let that sink in because I'm not sure you believe it he doesn't see you through your fault and I realize it maybe doesn't make sense when so often we feel like we're maybe not holding up our end of the relationship. Doesn't feel sometimes like we're maybe as faithful. But the scripture calls it this, unconditional love, or the theological term is unconditional love. Agape. Love. It's unconditional. That's why God created you. And he wants you to have a revelation of that this morning. Because when you have that, when you have that revelation, there's so much that comes out of that. Everything comes out of that. When you're walking in a close, intimate relationship with the Lord, you'll know what to do in situations. You won't be rattled by the Storms that are blowing around us. You won't. There's an interesting quote. Daniel Kalinda, who I've, you know, um, learned to appreciate uh, as an author. Uh, he is the successor to Reinhard Bonnke, who I've talked about before. Reinhard recently, not long ago, passed away. Um, an evangelist who would see uh, incredible miracles in his crusades. Um, uh, tens of millions of people came to Christ in the crusades that he has run around the world, in particular in nations in Africa. And Daniel Kalinda was raised up underneath him and was, is his successor in the, in, in the ministry of Christ for All Nations. In one of his books, he says this uh, in Spiritual Warfare, and they see uh, deliverances on, on mass in their crusades. Uh, people being set free, uh, people encountering uh, incredible 
physical healings. In fact, I heard a, a gentleman speak. He was brought in to speak at an event. He was actually a Muslim imam in Africa. He uh, lost the bet. Short version is he lost the bet. As a result, he had to drive these Christians to this Reinhard Bonnke crusade. <laughs> he didn't go himself, but he had lost this bet. He's at this crusade. He was plan was to drop him off and leave. But apparently they didn't park very orderly there. He got in there, dropped him off, and by the time he even got, they got out the car doors, um, he was hemmed in. He had to wait. He actually, part of his job with the people that he stayed with, he was a single guy. He looked after this little girl of the people, the, of the people that he lived with. She's 12 years old. She'd never walked. And as Reinhard Bonnke is preaching inside uh, the stadium, and, he's, uh, and then he's praying for the sick, this little girl who, this guy was embarrassed because he's a Muslim imam. <laughs> he's at this Christian crusade. So he's, sta- he's sitting, waiting outside this uh, stadium, and as Reinhard Bonnke is praying for the sick, this little girl who he had to bring with him because he's supposed to be looking after her throughout the day when these people are at work that he stayed with. It was part of his rent arrangement. Um, as Reinhard Bonnke prays and he says, in the name of Jesus, this little girl who had never walked jumps up. Well, it started that guy on a journey. <laughs> And he eventually gave his life to Christ. Not that day, but it, it, it totally threw him. Power of God helps people realize that there's more. Anyway, this guy ended up coming to Christ, and now he's, he's a minister of the gospel. He was actually speaking in Regina. This was a number of years ago. And um, uh, sharing about you know, his testimony and sharing about his conversion, and now he's a radical follower of Christ. Um, so Daniel Kalinda, in his uh, book, Slaying Dragons, says this on page 128. There is nothing Satan fears more than your intimacy with Christ. Chances are, many of the battles that you were fighting, and please hear me, there's a lot of battles today, isn't there? As I listen to people and as we're all trying uh, to navigate these things well in a God-honoring way, please hear this next statement. He says, chances are many of the battles that you were fighting will automatically lose significance and power as you become intimate with Jesus. If we will have our focus on the Lord, um, if we will walk in a close, intimate relationship with Him, We will know what to do. We will see and experience the power of God in our lives. And we will hear his still, small voice. Spend time with Jesus. Give him your full attention and focus. The great commandment, the two great commandments, of course, Jesus said the entire Old Testament is summed up with two great commandments. To love God with all your heart and your soul and your mind and your strength. And he said then to love your neighbor as yourself. It's all summed up in that. Giving God your full attention, your full focus, walking in a close, intimate relationship with Him. John chapter 12, verse 3. Can we turn there together, please? John chapter 12, verse 3. Um, it's the first part of the story that I kind of want to uh, spend the time on. Then we're going to be looking at Luke 10. But John 12, verse 3. Story of Miriam. Well, actually, we'll back up. And we'll go to verse 1, and we'll land on verse 3. Then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus, who had been raised from the dead, um, Lazarus Lazarus had been dead, I'm sorry. Uh, Of course, we could have that other person read it for us there. (laughs) Don't feel bad. Whom he had raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served. But Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, 
and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. Uh, as you study this, you actually realize that this was probably worth a year's wages. So today, you know, whatever, 30, 40, 50, 60,000 dollars, whatever a year's wages is. And um, it made no sense. It didn't even make sense to the disciples because they criticize uh, her. But there's this radical love that she has for Jesus. The fragrance of this costly perfume is a beautiful picture of our worship when life circumstances are challenging. It costs us something. It costs something to worship God sometimes when things are difficult. And let me say this, it costs something sometimes when actually you wonder why prayers weren't answered the way you thought that you would like them to be answered. I understand that. We all have personal experience with that. And when we don't understand, are we still going to worship? When we're in physical pain, are we still going to worship? Before we see the answers, are we still going to worship? When we don't know why God doesn't seem to be answering our prayers, or at least the way we want Him to, or in the timing that we want Him to, are we still going to worship? Mary, when it didn't make any sense, is wor worshiping. And you know, in, in fact, this fragrance of this perfume being worship. In Revelation chapter 8, there's a very interesting passage of Scripture there where the prayers of the saints who are in the midst of great tribulation on the earth at that time, when the prayers of the saints are, uh, who are being persecuted are mixed with incense and they're offered in worship to God before his throne. It's a fragrance when we worship. Last night at the beginning of the Holy Spirit night, um, we talked about how God is the initiator, and we simply respond to the Lord and his uh, initiation toward us. And so the very first song of worship, I asked everybody to remain, to remain uh, in their seats and just soak in God's presence. And we had a song that was six or seven minutes, and we just soaked, just receiving. I want to encourage you to make that a practice. How can we practically apply what we're talking about today? This is one of the ways. When things are really swirling for me, as much as that's not what I feel like doing at those moments, because I'm a bit of a doer, and we're going to talk about that here in the uh, time that I have left, because I'm a bit of a doer, when things are swirling, what I want to do is I want to do something. Not only do I get some comfort out of doing, I actually feel like I can make things different when I do things. Yeah. I just have to do them right, and I, yeah. But after a while, or sometimes, it feels like when you keep doing, it just gets a little exhausting because it's not working. Or at least it hasn't solved everything that needs to be solved. And so I'll take some time and just listen to worship, softer worship. Just allow the Lord to minister to me and come to him and say, okay, Lord, I'm waiting on you. I'm pausing. And it's not that I don't worship throughout the day, but in those moments where I'm just sitting and receiving, often I'll close my eyes, as I encouraged people to maybe do last night, as we just sat. And you know what? There's just this calming effect that happens because I'll say this when you walk intimately with the Lord because this is one of the ways we can walk intimately with the Lord just setting some time aside and in the opportunity we have before us today is to actually have worship music that we can just play and let that just minister his peace into our spirits now if you're a doer like me that's not what you want to do in those moments when you're feeling like things are kind of you know, swirling. But when you do that, can I say this? Our internal reality 
will eventually become our external reality. When you have peace here, there can be a storm going on around you and you will bring peace into that storm. When the storm was raging around Jesus, he's sleeping. And eventually that peace that he had inside, no fear, no anxiousness, eventually that peace he had inside, well, he brought that to literally to the circumstances around him and calmed the storm. But as long as we have a storm going on inside of here, and can I share with you that can happen as a believer? As long as we have a storm going on around here, our internal reality eventually becomes our external reality. And so we encourage people. We encourage people in our church, if you're watching this online, of course, all of our uh, extension of our church family, part of our church family in Moose Jaw, as you're listening today, if it feels like storm is going on in here, we, ha- we want to help you process this storm that you feel inside. Because no one can make you feel anxious. No one can make you feel angry. No one can make you feel fearful. Because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And the Prince of Peace lives inside of me. The Prince of Peace lives inside of you. And you don't have to be afraid. You don't need to be rattled. Jesus, the storm is raging. Jesus was sleeping in a storm. These guys, many of his disciples were actually fishermen. They lived on the water and they're afraid. You know, if you're ever flying and the stewardess or the, or the, the people serving you, when they look a little bit afraid, well, now we've got reason for concern, okay? <laughs> a little bit of turbulence. They're going around doing their job. They look all ho-hum. Well, no problem. But that's who you look at. These fishermen are terrified. They go to Jesus and say, Jesus, don't you care that we're going to drown? And Jesus said, why are you so afraid? Where's your faith? How do we have faith? Spend time with the Lord. Let him minister peace inside here. If there's specific areas that you want help with that, we want to help you with that. Because what's going on inside of here, well, eventually, many people in life, when there's such a big storm going on in here, we walk with those people. So please don't feel like I'm being trite in my comments. But when there's a storm going on inside around here, you know what they want to do? Just flip it all over and I want a fresh start. Well, the problem is, when the storm is still here, (laughs) Jesus wants to calm the storm. He wants to be the Prince of Peace in your life. He wants to comfort you where you need comfort. He wants to bring healing to the past things that have happened in your life. So they're not following you around. Mary pours out, lavishly pours out this expensive, costly perfume. Some people say actually this was her dowry that she was going to bring to her marriage. I can't, I don't know that for certain. But some theologians actually believe that this was the thing that she had, the one thing that she had that was so costly, so valuable, that she was going to bring that um, as part of a dowry thing when when she was going to get married. And she poured it out on Jesus' feet as a prophetic act, being inspired by the Holy Spirit, knowing that in a short time that he was actually going to be crucified. Uh, without even fully realizing it. You know, sometimes the Holy Spirit moves you in things and you look back and say, wow, okay, that's why God did that. I think this was one of those moments for Mary. She really didn't understand exactly what she was doing, but she was moved by the Holy Spirit because Jesus actually states that at one point. I want to turn to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 41. So as we're turning there, a practical way that you can do this, find some time during the day where you Get alone with the Lord and just sit and receive. Allow some some worship to to be playing and allow the Holy Spirit to minister to you. If you're like me, it might take you 15 minutes or more for your mind to even just slow down. But can I tell you, once that peace is ministered here, it doesn't mean that there isn't a storm going on around you, but you will know what to do. Let's look at this beautiful picture. Many of you may be familiar with this story. Luke chapter 10, verse 38. It's a story of Mary and Martha. Again, the two sisters that were mentioned in the John chapter 12 story we just looked at. Now, it happened as they went 
as they went that they entered a certain village and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. So M Martha welcomes Jesus and his disciples into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving and she approached him, Jesus, and said, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, and I really believe this is a word for the Lord for many of us this morning. Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things. But one thing is needed. Mary has chosen that good part which will not be taken away from her. Jesus didn't rebuke Martha for serving. And of course, serving, serving is good. <laughs> it's biblical. It's actually commanded in Scripture that we serve God, serve others. But it needs to come from this place of intimacy with the Lord. Can I repeat? The Lord really likes you. And I don't know if you realize how excited he gets when you just take time to spend with him. In this story, it does seem kind of strange. There's probably a lot of preparation to do. Meals were probably a little bit more challenging to prepare back then. Of course, no running water, no you know, electricity, none of this, right? It's, it's <laughs> a big group that's just showed up to her house, to their house, Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And Mary is doing absolutely nothing. <laughs> she isn't helping a bit. She, some of the, some of you ladies, I can see some of you guys that maybe cook, you're getting mad right now, actually. You're thinking, no kidding, I, I got to marry at my house. <laughs> Don't poke anybody. And no, the football game is not the same as sitting at Jesus' feet. Okay, so let's just get this straight here. Let's get our theology correct. But there's a picture here we really need to grab a hold of. There's always something else to do. I got lots of things to do. <laughs> and I like doing them most of the time. I like lists. It's a powerful thing crossing those things off, isn't it? <laughs> and crumpling up the paper. Praise God. But there's always something else to do. God wants us to live out of this place where we are spending time with him every day in his word. I want to give you just some practical suggestions here as we move toward conclusion of our message here today. One thing. One thing is needed. When you have that one thing, you will know what to do. When you have that one thing, you will never get far off track. Intimacy and closeness with the Lord. I talked about worship music being such a an opportunity for us. Set that up. Get it on your phone or if you've got a more traditional method that you use, have that handy. Sometimes I will just sit. I'll get up in the middle of the night and maybe I'm thinking about things. I don't feel like I worry very much, but I do think about things. And once I get thinking, I sometimes don't go back to sleep. So I'll go back. I'll go downstairs and pray. And, but sometimes I'll just turn the worship music on and just sit and listen. And just let the Lord minister to me. Grab a copy of the scriptures. Something to write things down with. And spend some time with him. This may take a little getting used to. But he's patient. He will help you. For some of us, we find it very hard just to sit still. If you're a doer, if you're a goer, um, it's okay. Don't beat yourself up over that. Don't be hard on yourself. Uh, God sees the effort 
the initiative. And he will honor that in your life. Some of us like to do, and we keep doing, because we're not, deep down inside, we know God loves us, okay? You've maybe even taught that to your kids or in Sunday school or maybe to adults. You've taught that, but in your heart of hearts, you question that, actually. Does God really like me, or does he love me just because he has to? He really does like you. And he wants to give you a revelation of that. And when you sit still for too long, some of us, and you're sitting, you really question that, actually. (laughs) So it's not very comfortable. Some of us, what makes this difficult is we we were raised in a way that when you were doing things, it was communicated to you that you had value. When you worked hard, when you did things, when you accomplished something, that you had more value. So sitting and just waiting on the Lord or spending time with Him of any significance seems almost, it seems very hard. Because we, without realizing it, many of us get our value out of accomplishing and doing things. And not that anybody meant to necessarily communicate that to us, per se, but often that's what was communicated to us. That when you did things, when you accomplished things, you, you're, you're, you have value. Sitting at Jesus' feet when there's things to do, actually, that's not valuable. Now, I'm not suggesting that tomorrow morning you stay home from work, <laughs> phone in sick, and you're not sick. Okay, that's lying, actually. <laughs> if God does speak to you, I can tell you what he would say. <laughs> Get up earlier. Be honest. Go to work, (laughs) okay? But in all seriousness, grab a copy of the Scriptures, grab something to write something down with, and spend time with Him. (coughs) In the upcoming season, this is going to be even more important. You know, love is the most powerful thing in the entire world. A bear, a female bear with her cubs, they tell you that's not, that's not, um, that's not a situation that you want to get between a female bear and her cubs. There, there was a, a story in the paper. It was about a year and a half ago, I think. This lady was up north uh, in Saskatchewan picking berries. And she says she always carried a gun when she was going into the woods to pick berries because you never know what you're going to run into. And uh, her and a friend uh, went into the forest they were, um, uh, got separated, uh, which, you know, not uncommon, I suppose, as they're picking berries. And all of a sudden there was this wolf. It was, it was quite tall, uh, but quite thin. She could see it was a lone wolf, probably kicked out of the pack, and was, it looked like it was starving to death. And it, and it was now, it got, by the time the lady looked up, the wolf was extremely close. And um, uh, the long and the short of it, this was on the national news, actually, uh, the long and the short of it is, is, is as this lady was, the wolf was pushing her further and further into the forest, uh, she, it didn't attack, but she knew that that was, you know, it was getting closer and closer, and, and she was just trying to fend off an attack, and she honestly thought she was going to die. And she said all of a sudden she saw a, a mother bear and her cubs. And she took the risk. She said, well, if I'm going to die, I, I, I'm going to at least take this risk. She said um, she went around and actually... Uh, walked in such a way that the, the, the wolf, who, of course, had his eye on her um, and planned on, you know, attacking her and, and, and in eating her because she could see that it was, a, it was starving um, because it was a lone wolf and they don't, just don't hunt well on their own. They weren't really made to do that. Uh, but the wolf ended up going between the mother bear and her cubs, which was her plan. And she said, I didn't see what happened, but she said it was a terrible ruckus that went on. <laughs> And she said, I just ran for, the, ran for the road. And she lived to tell about the story. I say a female bear will actually fight to the death uh, uh, a boar that's twice her size uh, protecting her cubs. You know, it's a picture of the love that God has for us. It's, it's ferocious. He loves you so much. And today, as 
as your pastor, I want to encourage you um, this one thing. If Jesus said, this is a fascinating statement to me, and I've meditated on it this week. One thing is needed. Martha, you're worried and concerned about many things. Put your name in there if that's your situation. You're worried and concerned about many things. And he said, Martha, Martha, he said, don't worry. There's one thing that's needed. Mary has chosen that, and it will not be taken away from her. If that's the one thing that Jesus said that we need in our lives, intimacy with him, sitting at his feet, daily communion with him, it's the one thing that as your pastor I want for you. And I can tell you this, that with all the stuff that's going on in the world, you don't have to just survive or barely get through. If you have that one thing as a central focus in your life, it will cause you to be a good employee, actually. It will cause you to be a good parent. You'll want to spend time with your kids. And you know what? Somehow when I spend time with the Lord, which is a daily practice of mine, I, I don't want to mislead you saying, oh, I'm just learning to spend time with the Lord. I, I couldn't do what I'm doing without spending time with the Lord because I, I don't have what it takes to do what he's asked me to do. I, I need him flowing through me. But when I really take that time to sit at his feet, it just seems like so many other things just kind of work out. Many of you will know and have experienced that. When I take that time and I don't feel like I have that time and I need to be quick and I need to get this done, and I just take that time, it's almost like Matthew 6.33, as it says on the screen there, you know, uh, or maybe it doesn't say on the screen. <laughs> uh, Seek ye first. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. All these things will be added unto you. Can we stand together, please? 1 John 4.18 says this, Perfect love casts out all fear. And can I say, share this with you? God wants to baptize you in his love today. Last night, people were getting baptized in the love of God. I want a fresh baptism of God's love. Because no matter what's going on around me, and I know that for some of you, as I look around this room today, I know that to varying degrees, I don't know all of you, uh, or at least what's going on in your lives per se this week. But for many of you, as I look around, uh, I know that you're facing challenges. But one thing is needed. <laughs> we don't need to be concerned and worried about many things. One thing is needed. And perfect love casts out all fear. Many people are fearful today. You don't need to be afraid. You don't need to be afraid of anything, actually. He holds you, the Bible says, in the palm of his hand. He will never let you go. Jesus said this, no one can snatch you from my Father's hand. No one. When we're worried and concerned about many things, it's not like God's left us if we, or we left his hand. We just don't feel it because we're focused on the storm that's going on all around us. Don't focus on the storm. Don't be anxious about what's going on in our society and restrictions and all these things. Don't be anxious. Don't be fearful. Don't be concerned about any of that. Sit at his feet. You will have everything that you need. He's with you. He is all-powerful. Omniscient is the theological term. He is all-powerful. He will never let you go. He's going to provide for you. He's watching over you. And he wants to fill you with his perfect love, as it says in John 4, 1 John 4, so that you don't have any fear. Lord, today, concern about tomorrow, you've instructed us, do not be afraid or concerned or worried about tomorrow. Lord, you've instructed us with that. Lord, we want to be obedient to that today. We invite your presence to come. Baptize us in your love today. In those spots in our heart, Lord, that maybe in our lives, in our minds, where we've kind of, without realizing it, we've got a, a, a section of our hearts and our minds that actually isn't filled with your love. And as a result, Lord, we're concerned, we're anxious, we're uncertain about tomorrow. Lord, fill those spots today afresh with your love. And draw us into this place, Lord, by your grace. For each one that's hearing my voice this morning, 
draw us into that place where we sit at your feet. We will know what to do, Lord. You're going to lead us. You are speaking to us already. It will allow us to hear your voice. And to see the storm for what it really is, Lord, just an opportunity is a testimony of your faithfulness and your grace. So come, Holy Spirit. Fill each one of us afresh today as we worship in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Mushta, we're going to sign off here. You've actually got a testimony that's coming, uh, so be encouraged with that. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, there's a testimony coming up uh, in the service there. God bless you. We love you so much. And uh, look forward to what God's going to do in the rest of our service. God bless you. Have a great time together. Bye.